You're listening to People United, the show in solidarity with the people of the world. I'm Alan Campbell. This week, People United features Fred L. McGee on his book, Austin's Montopolis Neighborhood, a historical look at the multi-ethnic neighborhood southeast of the Texas capital's urban core. Fred L. McGee is a maritime archaeologist and a historical anthropologist. He is also a longtime community activist that ran in 2014 in District 3 for Austin City Council. Twelve days after he failed to make the runoff, he spoke at Monkey Wrench Books in Austin's North Loop neighborhood on November 16th, 2014. His book, Austin's Montopolis Neighborhood was put out by Arcadia Publishing in August of that year. Here now is Fred L. McGee. You're listening to People United on KOP Hornsby, Austin. Austin's Montopolis Neighborhood. Did you know that Montopolis is older than Austin? What year was Austin founded? It says it on our crest, right? Austin, Texas, 1839. Well, here's a little story that you might not have heard before. Would you like to hear the story? I'm going to first hold up a picture. This is a picture of the headstone of the person who figures very prominently in this story. His name is Jesse Tannehill. Now, there are various land grants. If, for instance, you have property in Go Valley, Johnston Terrace, that portion of the city north of the river, you'll see that portions of those land grants have the name Tannehill on them, and there's even a Tannehill Street in that section of the city. But this is the person who established the neighborhood called Montopolis in 1830. Tannehill came here in 1827, during the period, of course, when Stephen F. Austin and other empresarios were looking to settle people, mainly Anglos, in various portions of what was then the new country of Mexico. But there were plenty of people like Tannehill who ended up squatting illegally in the far western reaches of some of these empresarial grants. And in 1830, he came here in what was then known as Mina or Bastrop. Travis County or Austin did not yet exist. And he found a little embankment and hill along a bend in the Colorado River and decided to name his new settlement Montopolis, which is Greek for city on a hill. So if somebody asks you what Montopolis means, that's what it actually means, city on a hill. Now, the concept of a shining city on a hill has a long history in the United States in particular. The Puritans, of course, used it in reference to the Massachusetts Bay Colony and so forth and so on. The city of Boston was described by many of its early English settlers as a shining city on the hill. This has a long tradition in Anglo-America. So anyway, he's the establisher of Montopolis. Of course, he didn't find the place bare. There were people and animals already here. And in the book, in the beginning portions of the book, I have some pictures of them. So what you'll see, if you go to page 13, is you'll see pictures of Tonka and Comanche Indians, who were the indigenous populations of this region of Texas. Now, they were feared by the Anglo settlers. They were called wild and savage Indians, and they were to be driven from the land, kind of like the buffalo, deer, turkey, and other animals that the Anglos encountered. That was actually ensconced on the historical marker on page 12 that I feature in the book, the text of which I partially reproduced beneath, where it says, the goal of this outpost, and this marker describes Fort Colorado, a Texas ranger fort, which was in this portion of Texas at the time. The purpose of the fort was to protect Anglo-American civilization from savage Indians in this vicinity. I really wanted to make it clear that there were aboriginal inhabitants of this land. Now, the property actually enters land records when a Mexican nobleman from Monclova named Santiago del Valle 
Del Valley is who this person is. The city, the town of Del Valley, Texas, is named for this guy, this nobleman here, who in the early 1830s, 1832 more precisely, purchased this land that now bears his name. Basically, the entirety of Southeast Austin and Travis County, all the way out to places such as LaGrange and Columbus, was part of Del Valley's land grant, which he recorded in San Felipe de Austin. And you can see, actually, this Texas Historical Commission marker if you go to McKinney Falls State Park, which explains the story of how this guy got this land. He never set foot in his real estate speculation venture. It was immediately subdivided to Anglo planters such as A.C. Horton, Albert Clinton Horton, whose picture hangs in the Capitol Rotunda. You know, there's pictures of all the governors when you walk around. Horton's is like the second or third picture. He was a planter from Alabama who established a bunch of plantations in present-day Columbus over in Wharton County. One of the nice things about this book, too, that I was able to do that had never been done before on page 11 is to produce a map of the original Montopolis settlement. Now, let me tell you the story behind this. The caption kind of does it some justice, but, you know, I'm the author. Now you get to hear it from the horse's mouth. What happens in Texas in the 1830s? Well, a lot of things happen. One of the biggest, of course, is the so-called Texas Revolution, whose end product was what? The establishment of a new republic, the Republic of Texas, independent of the Mexican Confederation. And what ends up happening? What were some of the consequences of the Texas Revolution? Slavery's there to last. Okay, that's one. One of the biggest outcomes of the Texas Revolution was the legalization of slavery because slavery's status under the Mexican Republic had been vacillating. But the tendency, certainly by the mid-1830s, was going to be the abolition of slavery. It had become clear that both centralist governments as well as federalist governments in Mexico were not pro-slavery. Famously, of course, Vicente Guerrero, who in the late 1820s was an Afro-Mestizo, who for a brief time occupied the presidency of the country, he, of course, was not in favor of slavery and sought to more aggressively stamp it out. But there were other people who would actually travel to the northern reaches of Mexico, to the northern states, such as Texas. Famously, Juan Almonte came here in 1834. He was preceded by a Mexican general named Tehran, in 1828, both of whom noted that the Anglo colonists who were settling Texas under the empresarial system were establishing slavery in Texas. One of the things that's not commonly acknowledged is that they did that largely with the not just open support, but outright legalization by Tejano elites. People such as Jose Antonio Navarro and others, Jose Francisco Ruiz, those are the only two Tejanos, by the way, who signed the Texas Declaration of Independence. There are only three Mexicans who signed the Texas Declaration of Independence. I just gave you two. Anybody know who the third one was? Lorenzo de Zavala. Lorenzo de Zavala. But he was not a Tejano. He was from the Yucatan. And he came up here, of course, and was a land speculator just like the other ones were. So in any case, one of the consequences of this is that Mirabel Bonaparte Lamar becomes president of the country of the Republic of Texas. He has grand visions of an empire all the way out to the sea in typical Manifest Destiny fashion. He wants a new Texas capital, and he wants it to be on the far western outskirts of the country. The far western outskirts of the country at that time basically was the Colorado River. Anything beyond that was, you know, wild Comanche Indians, Kiowa Comanche Indians who would kill you on sight, this kind of thing. So he dispatches a bunch of people led by a surveyor among his other talents named Edwin Waller who comes out here to establish the capital, to lay out a town site. Well, he eventually comes out here after a few weeks, you know, traversing Texas in those years by stagecoach and by horse took some time. We can go to Houston now in, in a couple of hours and be back relatively quickly. In those days, that was a trip that took many days, especially if it was raining outside and those roads were very muddy. But eventually he comes out here, but he finds that there already are people at the Colorado River living there in a settlement called Montopolis, led by Jesse Tannehill and his people. And they say to him, well, we've been waiting for you. You know, welcome. We've already scouted this place out, you know. We're real estate speculators like you. You know, let's establish the capital right here. We've already got some buildings built. You're welcome. You know, 
he would never think, they see dollar signs in their head, you know, we've been defending the place for forever from Indians and have domesticated the land. We've started to engage in some small scale farming. This is a wonderful thing. We're on a hill, so, you know, it's defensible from Indians. To make a long story short, what ends up happening is Waller says no, <laughs> okay? And he travels about three to four miles further up the Colorado River and establishes his Waterloo settlement there under the theory that it was even more defensible from wild Indian, savage Indian attack. And he names this new place Waterloo and proceeds to lay out town lots and begins to sell them. All of this was part of his instructions from President Lamar. All of this infuriated the Montopolis settlers who felt that they had been toiling in the wilderness for years and they considered it a betrayal. But one of the things that was really painfully apparent to them after a while is that Waller had the imprimatur of the federal government at his back. And he was a land surveyor, and he literally created out of nothing survey lots that became legal within the new general land office that the Republic of Texas was in the process of establishing. Matter of fact, one of the first things that he laid out was what? A capital and a land office in a country that was established to a large extent on both real estate speculation and Negro speculation. Negro speculation, by the way, was the euphemistic term for slave trading. So anyway, the response of the Montopolis settlers is in 1839, shortly after those lots laid out by Waller became legal, was for them to plat officially their own settlement. And this is the actual map that's in the files of Travis County. And You'll see here 55 lots along the Colorado River. They were incorporated by J.C. Tannehill, J.S. Lester, William Eastland, James Smith, Silas Dinsmore. Several of these blocks were laid aside for seminaries of learning and churches and so forth and so on. They basically looked at what Waller had done and decided to do the same thing. They actually were able to successfully sell a few of these lots in Montopolis, but it didn't work. And remember, there, there were four miles is a lot of, that was a big distance in those years. I mean, that was beyond the sticks. Over time, Austin grew into the metropolis that we now enjoy today, with its population doubling roughly every 25 or so years. Well, that's actually been true since the founding of the city. Austin's population has tended to double about every 25 years, sometimes less than that. As opposed to Montopolis, which quickly became a rural farming backwater. And then its settlers essentially had to resolve themselves to engaging in agriculture. And over time, that became plantation agriculture with the primary cash crop that was being grown, cotton. Now, who were some of these planters? Well, take a look at page 24. You all know where Callahan's General Store is, is on 183? Now, if you're headed north on 183 and you see that little Mazda 626 sticking out of the side of the building, if you take that road and follow it up, what you're going to eventually see is this building right here, which is one of the most historic buildings in all of Austin. It's one of the most historic buildings in Austin that nobody knows, except sort of people in the know. You all know what this is? Well, it's a plantation big house, and it belonged to Colonel Thomas Jones, a planter from Mississippi, this structure was built by his slaves in the 1840s, which is the time period that I'm talking about when Montopolis was essentially failing as a metropolis. It was clear at that point that Austin, and Austin assumed the name late in 1839, early 1840, the name of Waterloo was changed to Austin, and in 1840, Travis County was established. So then you have guys like Colonel Jones, and by the way, at that time, this is like sort of Southern tradition, but it's a really big tradition in a place like Texas, or like anybody and everybody, no matter the degree or character of their military service, had some sort of military rank. It's kind of like Colonel Sanders, the fried chicken guy. Was that man ever really a colonel? Anybody know? Doesn't matter. You know, he looked like he was a colonel, right? And if you can't be like, you know, his fried chicken, you know, I mean, it seems like it tastes pretty good, right? This is kind of like that too. Southern Convention he had a military rank. And he got the land from the Van Zant family. Van Zant, those are, of course, some of Austin's old 300, some of the original settlers. The key takeaway that I wanted you to all have of this building is what? The slaves who constructed this building were limestone constructors. They built this out of limestone. If you had money, that's what you built your stuff out of, limestone. Building stuff out of wood 
that was for actually that was for like sort of middle class people back then, even though it didn't exist. I mean, a lot of people were living in tents and in caves back then, but basically the elites had their stuff built out of brick, limestone, and later concrete. In any case, the enslaved people who constructed this house also constructed the first Texas capital, the first Texas state capital, and the first courthouse in Austin in the 1840s and 1850s. Not the capital we have now. The big one, that one was built in the 1880s by former slaves, by convict lease people. The original capital of Texas was built by Colonel Jones' slaves, who were very skilled limestone builders. Now we're going to look at Migration and Poverty Island, part two. This is a picture on page 31 of a cotton gin. Throughout the 19th century, Montopolis was the gateway to southeastern Travis County. Once you went across that bridge, you knew you were headed into the sticks. You were headed into rural. This is all before Bergstrom Air Force Base or any of this stuff. What you saw once you crossed that bridge is cotton plantations, which in the 19th century, up until the Civil War, were worked by slaves, and then afterwards were worked eventually by sharecroppers. Now, cotton gins came relatively late here to this part of the county. Taylor, up there, because of, well, another Commodore Perry. You know about that guy, the Commodore Perry estate? Now, he was a cotton broker, and he had a massive cotton operation up in Taylor, which was on the railroad. This wasn't on the railroad, so that was one of the reasons why it lagged behind a little bit economically. But eventually, he got a cotton gin, and this is a picture of what, you all know what a cotton gin is, right? An event about Eli Whitney. And then what you start seeing in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, especially subsequent to 1920, is you start seeing significant migration to places such as Montopolis, primarily from Mexico. Up until that point, the population, and, and you start seeing a greater diversity of the population in this region. And this is all a working class history here. Now, there were numerous push and pull factors driving this, of course. Mexico has had a series of revolutions, and there was a revolution again, what? You know, the famous Pancho Villa one, you know, the one in the early 20th century. Mexico, largely unstable. And Texas was what? Well, to a lot of Mexicans, it really never stopped being part of Mexico, quite frankly. I mean, there were plenty of Mexican Americans who have a long history in this part, the ones who weren't pushed out, because there were plenty who were pushed out by the Anglos after they conquered Texas in 1836 and then so forth. If you were a light-skinned Mexican, you more or less could assimilate into the racial hierarchy, into the pigmentocracy that the Anglos established in the 19th century here. That was probably very difficult to do if you were a darker-skinned Mexican. So what you start seeing, though, then, is that you start seeing Mexican migration of people of all kinds of pigmentation starting in the 1920s who start working alongside African Americans as sharecroppers in the fields. And that's what these pictures reflect. You start seeing stuff. For instance, this picture on page 32 is a picture of African Americans and Mexicans working side by side. I use that term Mexican advisedly because that's what they were called at the time. Some of them were Mexican-Americans, but even if they were, they were considered Mexicans. That's what explains, for instance, the Travis County International Cemetery on page 17. This is one of the oldest municipal cemeteries in Travis County, and it's called the International Cemetery because it was the official cemetery for the indigent, most of whom were what? Mexicans. This then led to, after significant migration, to the establishment of things such as this cemetery here, which you can see on Montopolis Drive, San Jose Cemetery. You know about this one? You all seen the pictures of that? What's the story behind that cemetery? Who knows? You start seeing a significant number of these Mexican cemeteries showing up in Travis County around this time because you started to have enough of a Mexican population to support it. And over time, politically, Mexican leaders started to see that they more or less occupied this intermediate position in the Jim Crow hierarchy of Texas at the time, and these politically active Mexicans considered it to be an embarrassment for them to have to attend Negro schools and to be buried in Negro cemeteries. So they started to engage in various forms of mutual uplift. They started to create beneficent societies and so forth and so on, started putting together money with the assistance of African Americans. The land for this cemetery was deeded to the Mexican founders of this cemetery by Lizzie Henry, an African-American woman who was the daughter of a slave. She's buried at the Burdett Prairie Cemetery. You know about that one? The Burdett Prairie Cemetery? 
If you look at pages 22 and 23, Burdett's Prairie is what the free slave settlement of Montopolis was called. There were a variety of free slave communities, freed, so-called freedmen's communities, both urban and rural in Texas and in Austin right in the post-emancipation period, right after the Civil War. Some famous ones that you've probably heard of already are Wheatsville or Wheatville, Clarksville. You heard about these? Masontown. Masontown is now known as Plaza Saltillo. But like a lot of things in Austin before, it was Mexican, it was black. When it was created, when it was turned into Plaza Saltillo in the 1990s, its history as one of the oldest black neighborhoods in Austin had been completely obscured. There's another one, it's called Barton Springs. Do you all know about the Barton Springs Cemetery? Have you heard about that one? That's right off of Lamar. That's on South Lamar. Free slave cemetery with burials going back to the 1850s. Just like this one. These were free slave communities, and this one is still intact. Matter of fact, we, those of us who live and work in Montopolis, have engaged in a variety of efforts to try to clean up the cemetery because portions of it were being used as a dump. People around the neighborhood were just throwing, you know, aluminum fence pieces, engine parts, all kinds of different stuff right on top of the headstones. It was really, it was pretty bad. Portions of it are also vegetated over. I mean, it's like a forest. You actually have to hack through it with a machete. And then eventually you start seeing headstones literally, you know, crooked and knocked over. Very, very interesting archaeological stuff. In any case, you start seeing then in this portion of the book documentation of what it was like to live in an area such as Montopolis in the 1920s and 1930s. One of the biggest things that takes place in Austin at this time, and keep in mind, Montopolis is not part of the city of Austin at this time. I mean, one of the biggest and most interesting things that explains some of that, let me just give you some background. This picture right here on the cover of the book, you all know what this is? Oh, uh, you mean the Montopolis Bridge? Yeah. Yes, this is the Montopolis Bridge, but not the current one. This is the original Montopolis Bridge. Now, building bridges across the Colorado River was a big deal. I show pictures here, for instance, of the ferry. Ferries were what, in the initial years of Anglo settlement, that's how you got across the river when there weren't floods. And of course, we're famous here for our floods. So you had a ferry, then pontoon bridges were also tried. But in 1888, Travis County sold $15,000 worth of bonds and built an iron bridge across Montopolis. That was, the, at that point, the fifth bridge across the Colorado River, and the last one, the one that was furthest south and east. It lasted a long time, well, relatively long period. It was also the last bridge to be washed away by a flood. In 1935, one of Austin's infamous floods washed away all of the ones. You've probably seen some of the pictures of, the, you know, of various iterations of the Congress Avenue Bridge, all of that stuff completely underwater, taming the Colorado River, has been part of the history of Austin for many years, our series of dams and so forth and so on, the creation of Tom Miller Dam, of Lake Austin, of Town Lake or Lady Bird Lake, whatever you want to call it, so forth and so on. Well, the Montopolis Bridge, the original one, this one, washes away in 1935. That, of course, is during the Great Depression, and federal relief money was requested, which then led to the construction of the Montopolis Bridge that's there now. And it was completed in 1938. And you can see on page 34, pictures of the very first cars driving across the Montopolis Bridge after it had been constructed. And this is a picture of the plaque. That bridge, by the way, is in the National Register of Historic Places. TxDOT put it in there in 1996. That bridge is gonna be decommissioned. It's gonna become a hike and bike bridge as part of the Lance Armstrong Hike and Bikeway because a bunch of new bridges are gonna be built across the Colorado River. You know those piers that stick out of the ground there now? I have pictures, conceptual bridges, of what TxDOT and CTRMA wanna put in place back there. And the, those are the last pictures in the back of the book. So that bridge is gonna stick around. It's gonna be preserved in place. The picture underneath the plaque is a picture of George Matthews. He was, was, he was the Travis County Sheriff from 1903 to 1920 and the county judge from 1921 to 48. He worked on the original bridge crew when he was a young man on the original Montopolis Bridge. The bonds that the county sold at that time were very crooked, so the story goes. I looked at some of the newspaper accounts of the bond money, and Matthews, when the funding for the new bridge came in and the new bridge was finally constructed, he burnt the 14,000 or so dollars that were still left over in indebtedness from the original bridge like literally put them in a trash can, like set them ablaze. So he's real happy about that. The pictures that you see on pages 33 and 34 
are pictures of Mexican recreation at Zaragoza Park. Zaragoza Park is Austin's original Mexican park. You all know about the 1928 master plan that segregated Austin, that created various zones of the city, uh, which broke down the city in terms of where blacks could live and where Mexicans could live. Montopolis was not part of that planning because it was not part of the city. Montopolis was not annexed by the city. Actually, Montopolis was annexed by the city of Austin between the early 1950s, and it wasn't finished. Actually, it's still being annexed in many ways until the 1980s. So, you know, it's a relatively new part of the city. But the portions north of the river that contained the Mexican portion of the city was more or less the area around Zaragoza Park. The original segregationist park in Austin was created in 1930, and that was the Rosewood Park for Negroes. The segregated Austin Parks Department created that park, and then a couple of years later, Zaragoza Park was created. And here's some pictures of people from Montopolis going north, going across the bridge, across the river, to participate in a dance. This photograph shows a lively dance in 1934. Mexicans dancing in 1934 during the heyday of the Great Depression, right here. And then doing various other kinds of recreational activities. These are pictures from the 1930s and so forth. Something that really affected Montopolis greatly and changed really forever the fortunes of the entire southeastern portion of Travis County was when the county, for more or less a pittance, sold thousands of acres of farmland to the federal government for the creation of Bergstrom Army Airfield, or later Bergstrom Air Force Base. Actually, it was originally called Dell Valley Army Air Base, and it became Bergstrom. Who was Bergstrom, by the way? Who knows? It was the first... Austin, I killed in World War II. There you go. Our airport is named, well, the air base, the Air Force Base was named Bergstrom Air Force Base. And who was the Bergstrom? The first person from Austin to be killed in World War II. So that's who Bergstrom Air Force Base is named for. And then when the Air Force Base was converted into our present airport, the name was retained. And when you go to the airport, you'll see, of course, the display that explains all of this. And then I have some pictures of what Bergstrom Air Force Base looked like at the beginning and also some pictures of Governor Coke Stevenson, who of course was governor of Texas in the 1940s, inspecting some planes and doing the things that Texas governors did in those years. And then of course, I have some pictures of the Morris Crossing Bridge, which is currently at Richard Moya Park. Another iron bridge, which is somewhat similar to the Montopolis Bridge. That bridge is still in use too. You all been to Moya Park? Picked some pecans, that kind of, been out there? Lots of nice pecan trees. Unfortunately, it flooded but it was recently reopened by the county. Take a look at page 47. I wanted this to be the cover of the book, but my publisher told me that it wasn't gonna fit. What do you see there? You see something about the African-American religious legacy of Montopolis. This is a baptism in the Colorado River taking place beneath the Montopolis Bridge from 1938. This is Reverend S.L. Davis and Mabel Thompson, who's the person being baptized and you can see that, you know, the Holy Spirit, the Lord has got its grips in her. There she is right there, being baptized away. Reverend Davis was a minister at David Chapel in Austin for many years. And then Allison Elementary, where my kids go to school, in Montopolis. The story behind that school is very interesting. After the city of Austin started annexing Montopolis in 1952, certain educational decisions had to be made because those children who were living in Montopolis were actually not being educated by the Austin Independent School District. They went to a school district that eventually became known as the Colorado School District. And I show some pictures of the Colorado schools here earlier in the book on pages 26 and 27. They were ramshackle shacks, more or less. And these were the buildings that were used to educate the majority of the population. About 100 to 200 school kids went to these buildings, which leaked in winter. These were the buildings for the Colorado School for Negroes. There were two. And then eventually, over time, there grew to be a Mexican school. But I'll have more to say about that in a minute. The Wilhoit family bought one of these buildings, and that's not where Montopolis Supply is. You know Montopolis Supply, which is on 183? That was actually an African-American school. In any case, Allison Elementary was constructed by Austin ISD in 1955, with an addition constructed later on in the late 1970s. And that was to begin the process, slowly but surely, 
of providing basic educational services to the kids who live there, but also to slowly begin the process of integrating Metopolis into the city. The school is named for Laura Lutetia Allison, who was a longtime teacher in the Austin School District. She was also one of the founders of the state of Texas's teacher retirement system. There's some trivia for you there. If any of you all participate in TRS, Allison Elementary School, that's who it's named after. You're listening to People United, the show in solidarity with the people of the world. I'm Alan Campbell. This hour, People United is featuring Fred L. McGee on his book, Austin's Montopolis Neighborhood, a historical look at the multi-ethnic neighborhood southeast of the Texas capital's urban core. Fred L. McGee is a maritime archaeologist and a historical anthropologist. He is also a longtime community activist that ran in 2014 in District 3 for Austin City Council. Twelve days after he failed to make the runoff, he spoke at Monkey Ranch Books in Austin's North Loop neighborhood on November 16th, 2014. His book, Austin's Montopolis Neighborhood, was published in August of that year. So far, we have heard him talk about Montopolis' history from its founding in 1830 through the early years of its annexation by the city of Austin. We continue with him covering the neighborhood from the 1960s to the present day. Here again is Fred L. McGee. You're listening to People United on Co-op Radio. Now, let me fast forward and talk about this guy right here, who plays a tremendous role in the modern history of Montopolis. This is Father Fred Underwood. Father Underwood came to Montopolis as a priest from the Congregation of the Holy Cross in 1962. Father Underwood has an interesting biography. He's from the Midwest, from Indiana originally, and had a history as a builder. Uh, He had tremendous real estate experience working in his family business and other sorts of things. He also served in World War II as a bombardier, but felt compelled to join the priesthood. He was called to the priesthood in the 1950s, And in 1956, he was ordained a priest at Notre Dame. And Montopolis is one of the first places he goes. The Montopolis that he encountered in 1962 in the Dolores Parish that he was sent to head at that time, it's fair to say that it was in some state of crisis. Montopolis at that time was involved in just a tremendous amount of gang warfare. At this point, Montopolis had become a classic sort of, not even a suburban, almost a rural barrio where you had gangs, rival gangs fighting each other. Montopolis gangs fought gangs from East Austin because if you were from Montopolis, you were not from East Austin. That was a completely different thing. That bridge and that river, two different worlds. And those guys also went down and fought gangs in other parts of the state, in San Antonio. They even went as far as Corpus Christi to you know, do some stuff down there. So Father Underwood begins a process of trying to do something for the youth of Montopolis. He famously goes to the Austin City Council and says, Austin City Council, there are a tremendous number of community needs here. You all have no idea the conditions under which these people are living. The homes, if you could even call them that. Not only are they not up to code, these people are living like in shacks from the 19th century with outhouses, no running water, with wells that barely pump, this kind of thing. You know, with houses that leak in the winter, that are incredibly hot in the summer. We need your help. And the Austin City Council says what? There was one person who listened, Emma Long. Emma Long, you know, she kind of listened to what Father Underwood had to say. But the City Council says, we don't have any money. Go away. What does Father Underwood do? Well, he's a young, enterprising priest. What he ends up doing is he mortgages his church. He took out a 100% loan and builds a building called the Montopolis Community Center, which was completed in 1964. And he uses that building as a springboard to initiate all sorts of pioneering programs, which he is the initiator of. I mean, this, is almost, this history has been almost completely forgotten. For instance, did you know that Father Underwood is one of the, actually, he's the first nonprofit housing developers in Austin? Did you know that he is one of the earliest Montessori educators in Austin? 
Did you know that he ran anti-gang programs funded by the federal government and the war on poverty that reduced gang activity in Metropolis by 80% and that became a national model that was exported to other states, never mind other cities in Texas? Tremendously important figure. And I document much of it here. There's a picture on page 52 of Dolores Church. I talk a little bit about the history of Dolores Church in the introduction of the book. This is not the first Dolores Church. The original Dolores Church was a little bit further up, closer to the river. This building was built later. In those years, when Father Mendez came to Montopolis in the 1930s, because there were at that point enough Catholics in the area, he started doing baptisms, he started performing weddings. He actually originally just did it in the house of some of the people who were living there. The streets in Montopolis are named for some of those people. So that's a picture of Father Underwood. Now, here's another thing that I wanted to show you. Y'all know who this is? That's Sergeant Shriver. Why is Sergeant Shriver in my book about Montopolis? Well, Sergeant Shriver, of course, is who? He was known as the, what, the fourth Kennedy or whatever? What do they call him? They, he was called a lot of things. He was John and Bobby Kennedy's brother-in-law. He's Maria Shriver's dad. Did a lot of things. He was, what, the founder of the Peace Corps, among other things. But he was also, after his brother-in-law was assassinated, he became Lyndon Johnson's czar on the war on poverty. This guy ran the war on poverty. He was the head of the Office of Economic Opportunity, which produced all kinds of programs in the mid-1960s. VISTA, you know that program, VISTA, Volunteers in Service to America? It was changed in 1993 by Bill Clinton, who called it AmeriCorps. I assure you, the original program from 1965 didn't have the limitations that AmeriCorps has about political organizing which is one of the reasons it was changed. But anyway, did you know that Father Underwood, well, for, and of course these guys were heavy duty Catholics, so of course, and he's from Chicago, so there you go. You know, you put the two together, what do you get? You get a local priest who had dubbed Montopolis Poverty Island, that was its nickname. After the city council told Father Underwood, we have no money, he started calling as part of his advocacy, he started referring to Montopolis as Poverty Island. It was an island of poverty, and our elected officials, local elected officials, didn't care for both race and class reasons, by and large. So what Father Underwood did is he was very enterprising, builds the Metropolis Community Center, which opened in 1964, starts running programs out of that center. But then, as President Johnson announces his war on poverty, Father Underwood uses his Catholic connections and gets a direct pipeline to the head the federal head of the war on poverty. And what starts happening? Federal money starts flowing into Austin that bypasses locally elected officials at the state and local level, infuriating them. That's one of the reasons why the war on poverty was killed, because this happened in other cities as well. It happened in cities like Newark, and we all know about the riots in Newark and all of that. But in Austin, the history is not nearly as contentious as in Newark. What happens is, is in 1966, Father Underwood goes back up to Chicago, talks to some of his army buddies, and drives back down with some army buses, World War II army buses, slaps a coat of paint on them, and initiates the first bus service in the history of Montopolis called PIT, Poverty Island Transportation. <laughs> Keep in mind, Montopolis Drive at this time was a dirt road. None of the stuff that exists there now it didn't exist at that time. There were no street lights, none of that stuff. Riverside didn't go all the way out. Old Torf didn't dead end at Montopolis. None of that was there. And who funded it? Sergeant Shriver. This is the first such program financed by the Office of Economic Opportunity. And he personally came down from Washington and took the first trip on one of the buses. So the message of that is, is the war on poverty worked. It very much did in places such as Montopolis. On page 57, you can see a picture of kids playing in front of the Montopolis Community Center. Back when the plaque, the, you know, the verbiage on the building still said Montopolis Community Center. What's it known as now? It's called the Montopolis Recreation Center now. By the early 1970s, the nonprofit organizations that Father Underwood had started, along with the Dolores Parish, had been so successful 
and tackling the challenges of poverty and education in Montopolis that the city finally gave in and started applying for funding from the federal government. Once Father Underwood saw that, it was a scale problem as much as anything else, he began to start transferring some of his operations over to the city. And the city in the early 1970s acquired the community center building and rebranded it as the Montopolis Recreation Center. But it kept many of the things that Father Underwood had initiated, such as the boxing tournaments. If you ever wonder why there's so many damn Mexican boxers from Del Valley, Dove Springs, and Montopolis, one of the reasons is because Father Underwood used that as a way to get these gang members off the street and to get them to do something productive with their lives. To this day, at the Montopolis Recreation Center, there's a boxing room with much of the original equipment that has been around there for over 50 years. And those of us who live and work in the community, we want that identity to continue with the new recreation center that the city is currently in the process of bidding out. In 2012, Austin voters approved a new recreation center in Montopolis. And many of us in the community are very interested in making sure, and one of the reasons I wrote this book is to explain to city planners and others, look, this is what you need to live up to. This is the story. The problem is, is that until this book came out to a large extent, city planners and various members of boards and commissions had viewed Montopolis purely as Poverty Island as a place that not just should be, I mean, it's a place that should be gentrified. And they openly said so. And that was because a lot of those people didn't think that Montopolis had a history. But that's typical. That's not unusual. Another thing that I think people didn't know, on page 67 up top here, I have a picture of something that most people have forgotten as well. This is a picture of the Austin Country Club. I mean, the Austin Country Club. The one where Harvey Penick, the iconic University of Texas golf coach, taught for over 50 years, where Ben Crenshaw, Tom Kite, and others learned to play golf. This was, of course, what? In southeastern Austin, in southeastern Travis County. It was scarcely in the city limits. But if you ever drive up Riverside and you ever wonder why there's some of the, that street called Country Club, if you drive up there, that's a legacy of the fact that it was actually next to the Country Club. This is the Country Club building as it appeared in the 1950s when the golf course, and of course it was completely segregated, the people who cooked the food and you know, served them their lemonade were African Americans. Now this golf course is known as what? Well, it's the golf course that's at the ACC Riverside campus. The ACC Riverside campus began in the early 1980s as Austin Community College's third campus. And then, of course, the Montopolis Montessori School is right here. You know, the Escuela Montessori, you know about that, the one that's on Montopolis? Most people don't know that that school was initiated by Father Underwood. What is the oldest Montessori school in Austin? Anybody know? And what year was it founded? It's the Austin Montessori School. It was founded in 1967. What's the second oldest? This one. This is the second oldest Montessori school in Austin, founded in 1969. And then the Montopolis Friendship Community Center on Vargas, next to a picture of one of my opponents from the District 3 City Council race. I had to put a picture of her in there. Y'all know who this is? This is Susana. This is Susana Almanza. And this is a picture of Susana from when she was in the Brown Berets. This is at a barbecue at El Centro from 1978, when she was a younger woman. Although we were opponents in the city council race, I think we're still pretty cordial terms. And then, of course, Gonzalo Barrientos. And the wonderful John Trevino, the first Hispanic member of the Austin City Council when he was elected to that position in 1975. He's also the first Hispanic mayor pro tem in the history of the city of Austin. He has a wonderful story about meeting Father Underwood. That's in a documentary made about Montopolis in 1985 that served as an inspiration for this book. When Father Underwood came to Montopolis, Mr. Trevino, who ended up becoming a VISTA volunteer in Montopolis, one of the original ones in Austin, talked about seeing this priest you know, wearing nothing but a white t-shirt, it was summer, and riding a motorcycle. And he said, I couldn't help but noticing that he was white. <laughs> What's he doing in the most Hispanic part of the city? You know, I thought that was kind of cute. And then I talk about Bergstrom Air Force Base and how the original Montopolis Neighborhood Association grew to fruition in the early 1980s. It's because of these F-111 jets, which would scream over you know, the heads of the school kids at all hours of the day and sometimes well into the night. 
And the community eventually got organized, went before the city council, and then also tried to talk to the wing commander at Berkston Air Force Base, but they got frustrated because that position changed like every 18 months. So just as they had negotiated an agreement to try to reduce the number of flights or at least to keep them in a different way, things would change. And also, there were plane crashes. Montopolis has been victimized, quite frankly, over the years by several plane crashes, including crashes that literally went into people's homes. A lot of people live in South Austin. You hear the train, we hear the planes. Actually, we can hear the train too, because that's a damn loud train, but we have to be really quiet. But it's the planes that we hear most of all. Joaquin Mariel, you know Joaquin from Ecology Action? Ecology Action took over some land, about 10 acres or so in Montopolis, that was a former dump that had been remediated, more or less, by the Rhizome Collective in the early 2000s using an EPA grant. This is at a time when the city of Austin, that's how it did environmental justice. We're not going to clean it up. Even though it was a dump over there, oh, we have these hippies over here who have a grant with the EPA, let them do it. Well, Rhizome Collective over time eventually ended up establishing a hippie commune over there. And then the city went over there and started, was like, what the hell are y'all doing out here? You have composting toilets, you're living in trailers. You're doing all kinds of crazy, you know, they had a BMX, they created a BMX park. As people started riding BMX bikes and doing all kinds of interesting things down there. So the city shut them down and Ecology Action got the land. And now they're in the process, they call it Circle Acres. They're in the process of turning it into an educational facility. Really interesting stuff. I think you'll be hearing a lot more about it. So our neighborhood is slated for serious development, gentrification, however you think about it, positive or, or negative. And, you know, many of us looked at what happened over the past 14 years to East Austin and the 78702 zip code in particular and saw that this was what was being planned for our community. And I felt very strongly that I needed to do something to document what was there so that the excuse that people often used in the greenwash gentrification of East Austin would no longer be there. In other words, Planners and others could no longer say, or, or new arrivals to the neighborhood, the gentrifiers themselves, could no longer say, I didn't know. Now you do know. Now you do know some of the people and some of the institutions that have made this community what it is. Now we can begin to have an intelligent conversation about how we can move forward, about what the balance would be between development and retention of things that we consider to be valuable and hold most dear. So that was one of the main reasons I wrote the book. What happened to Father Underwood? Uh, you, I mean, obviously, that was quite a few ago. Mm -hmm. He was coming on strong. And, uh, did he get reassigned to another parish? The question is, what happened to Father Underwood? After Father Underwood left Dolores, he went over to San Jose in South Austin and built that cathedral that's there. You know, they call it the Cathedral of South Austin, that Spanish colonial-style cathedral. It's off of Oltorf. Father Underwood built that. He passed away in 2000 and is buried at Assumption Cemetery in South Austin. The feeling seems to be that Montopolis is going to gentrify. One of the reasons that's going to happen is because of the East Riverside Corridor, which is the law now. The East Riverside Corridor was approved, and that bisects Montopolis. It essentially cuts the neighborhood, the current planning area, in half. That, by the way, wasn't its original planning area. The borders, the boundaries of Montopolis have shifted over the years. Montopolis in the 1980s went all the way out to Pleasant Valley. There's a picture of that map in here. And then the city more or less started to move the boundary further and further east to where it's now at Grove. And what did they do when they did that? They built a bunch of student housing, multifamily student housing. That's the trend line. That's the pattern. So I have talked about organizing Montopolis and us trying to become a historic district, similar to the other both local and federal historic districts, such as Hyde Park or Old West Austin. That's going to take a lot of doing, especially if you pursue, well, you have to get permission. You know, at least 50% of the homeowners in the district have to agree to the designation because the designation means something. It means it limits what you can do to your private property, to your house. The truth is, is that there are quite a few people in Montopolis who, if they were offered a lot of money, they would sell, just like the people in East Austin did. A lot of people complain about gentrification, but that's actually what happened. A lot of people took the money. It's easier to complain. One of the things this book does is it documents, as it's happening, 
what's going on. If we do sort of a retrospective of the gentrification of 78702 and actually produce the GIS map or some other kind of form of documentation of who actually accepted the money that they were offered to sell, I think it would surprise some people. Yes, sir. One of the points that Mike Martinez emphasizes is that there's more renters in Austin than there are homeowners. And within Montopolis, what's the breakdown of renter versus homeowner? What is the breakdown of renters versus homeowners in Montopolis? I suspect it's higher than District 3 at large. District 3 has the highest percentage of renters of all 10 city council districts. Only 27% of District 3 voters own their own home. In other words, 73%. But remember, we're talking there about a lot of people who live further up on Riverside, who live in all of that student housing and multifamily housing and stuff like that. Montopolis is probably higher. I would say it's in the 40s, 30s or 40s. It's not the majority. I, you know, it could be the majority, but I doubt it. But that's one of the biggest tipping points in gentrification. If you have a minority, a largely minority population, if you have a high poverty population, and if you have a high concentration of renters, those are three key factors that influence gentrification. Probably heard about Eric Tang's, Professor Eric Tang's study of what happened to the African American population of Austin between the 2000 and 2010 census. Those were three key variables that he was able to document. The African-American population of East Austin was large. They were pushed out. The schools were bad. Also, many of them were renters and many of them were poor. Those were key variables. So I think there is enough of a key constituency in Montopolis. We're facing, don't get me wrong, we're facing the pressures of gentrification. But there are enough key active people in the neighborhood, I think, who are willing to do what's necessary to keep those forces at bay as best as possible. And if nothing else, to negotiate something that can work. For instance, at 600 Kemp, we had a zoning case where a developer, because you know, that's right along on the hill overlooking Guerrero Park with the city in the background, some of the best views in the city. Now, one of the reasons that property was never developed is because it was a dump, okay, until it was remediated by the Rhizome Collective and others in ecology action. Now it's cleaned up, the real estate sharks want to move in. And at 600 Kemp, they wanted to upzone the property to, you know, SF6, which would have allowed them to build a 60-unit condominium complex. I live in the southern portions of Montopolis and am the president of my own neighborhood association there, the Carson Ridge Neighborhood Association. And I joined forces with Susanna and her people, and we, we fought that. I mean, that's not acceptable. We're just not, I mean, come on. That's ridiculous. Our neighborhood planning area has already one of the highest concentrations of commercial and industrial zoning. Our neighborhood has by far the highest concentration of assisted housing. One of the reasons is because of Father Underwood, who used the Section 235-236 program to build Fairway Village. But just about any multifamily in Montopolis that you see now has got low-income housing tax credits associated with it. People call that affordable housing, but that's a larger discussion on whether that housing is actually affordable. Yes, sir? As a historian and also a community activist, it's a big question, but what's your view on, uh, like, Imagine Austin? As a historian, what do I think about Imagine Austin and similar kinds of things? Mm -hmm. I read Imagine Austin thoroughly. As a city council candidate, I had to. And one of the things that struck me about it is that there is ample, actually more than ample discussion of Austin's natural environment. Matter of fact, it's like 40% of the document. The book, the Imagine Austin book is like 300 plus pages. Just like the first 30 to 40% is nothing but description of Austin's natural environment. When you take a look at the description of Austin's cultural heritage and environment, it's like six pages. And it's all within the context of Austin's music scene. There's something wrong with that. Now, how did this state of affairs come to be? It wasn't by accident. There actually is a historical answer to that question. It's a form of cultural imperialism, quite frankly, if you really want to break it down. In the late 1990s, a detente was brokered by our former mayor at the time under the so-called Green Council between the long-feuding environmental organizations and the developers. The buzzword of the time was this thing called smart growth, you'll recall. Is this Watson? Yes, and his successor. And an agreement was concluded that resulted in a variety of things. Remember, the Green Council, the smart growth philosophy at that time was predicated on what was called the three-legged stool. 
prosperity, sustainability, and equity. Those were supposed to be the three portions of the three-legged stool. Well, how did that equity thing work out? It didn't work out too well, did it? What happened? Well, as a result of this agreement, which was endorsed by the Real Estate Council of Austin, the Austin Chamber of Commerce, and the SOS Alliance, 50,000 acres of pristine land in the hill country was purchased using taxpayer money because it lays over the aquifer, which is the only environment in Austin that matters. What happened to East Austin? It was part of what was newly called the Desired Development Zone. What does that imply to you when I use that phrase, Desired Development Zone, DDZ? That's where we want to steer our development. Why? Because it's away from the only environment that matters, the stuff that's over the aquifer. How much money have we spent over the past 14, 15 years buying land out there, both in Hayes County out and all over the place over there? I think that was one of the things that the voters of Austin rejected in 2012 when we went to districts is, you know, they finally had had enough of that and said, okay, we, we, I mean, come on, you know. You know, had I been elected, one of the things I would have done is I would have basically said, we're going to make that agreement that was negotiated in 1999 null and void, and we're going to renegotiate a new agreement that reflects the realities of our new 10-1 environment that pursues not just environmental justice, but economic justice, because the two go hand in hand. But we'll see. What's going to be at stake with the future council is going to be the degree to which individual city council members, and it'll probably be the council members from districts one through four, those are the higher poverty districts, with portions of districts five and nine thrown in there, the degree to which they're willing to talk about this openly and the degree to which they're willing to pursue redistributive justice and to the degree to which they're willing to use that word inequality, not just affordability, inequality, because inequality implies something. Inequality implies that there's a relational difference, that our city over the past 14, 15 years has grown less equal And that in order to restore that balance, more or less something like this needs to happen. And the people who are up here, they don't want to hear that. And they will fight that. That's, I think, what's going to be interesting to observe in 2015, once the council is seated, as I see it. Thanks again. You've been listening to People United, the show in solidarity with the people of the world. This week, People United featured Fred L. McGee on his book, Austin's Montopolis Neighborhood. Fred L. McGee is a maritime archaeologist, a historical anthropologist, a community activist, and an unsuccessful 2014 candidate in District 3 for Austin City Council. His book, Austin's Montopolis Neighborhood, was put out by Arcadia Publishing in August of 2014. Fred L. McGee spoke at Monkey Ranch Books in Austin's North Loop neighborhood on November 16th, 2014. I'm Alan Campbell, and you've been listening to People United on 91.7 FM, KOP, Hornsby, Austin.